Good evening and welcome to Alumni Weekend at the Kennedy School. And we're very lucky to have for Alumni Weekend a speaker uh, with a truly distinguished background, uh, but a woman who can't hold down a job since she's about to change yet again. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce Alice Ruglin. Uh, born in Philadelphia, she grew up in Bloomington, Indiana, and I'm told that she still considers herself very much a Hoosier. She returned to Philadelphia for college, where she graduated from Bryn Mawr, and then came to Harvard for her PhD in economics in 1958. Her book on the role of the federal government in financing higher education was published in 1961, and she's followed it with numerous books on budget, tax, health care, and related public policy issues. Most recently, Reviving the American Dream, the Economy, the States, and the Federal Government was published by Brookings in 1992. And I want you to know, Alice, that uh, the first month that I was dean, I had a lot of things on my mind. One of the things I did was to look up your book to remind me of some things you'd said to me, and I found them extraordinarily useful. So uh, it's still an important book. Alice Rivlin was the founding director of the Congressional Budget Office, uh, an institution which has been a success, and she served in that post from 1975 to 1983. She then directed the Economic Studies Program at Brookings from 83 to 87 and was a senior fellow there until 93. She served as deputy director of the Office of Management and Budget from January 93 until October 94 when she was nominated, uh, or her nomination was confirmed by the Senate, sorry. Uh, she is now scheduled to go to be the deputy director of the Federal Reserve where I know she will again distinguish herself. In any case, this is Alice's uh, second time at the Kennedy School. She was here uh, in two capacities at various times. I think where God can lecture and then as a visiting professor. Uh, and all I can say is we're ready to welcome her back, not only tonight, but any time she wants to come back. So please join me in welcoming Alice Ripley. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be back at the Kennedy School. It's a uh, wonderful place uh, to think and learn about uh, public policy. And I had a wonderful time when I taught here all too briefly and on return visits. This has been a very tough week, a week and a half uh, in Washington for people who are involved in public policy. We lost Ron Brown. We lost Charles Meisner at the uh, Department of Commerce. We lost a long list of wonderful people. I'm not sure if any were Kennedy School alumni, but they were the same kind of people. Very uh, dedicated, young, young and middle uh, uh, people who uh, were working hard, doing what they wanted to do. Uh, for uh, public policy, and they just happened to crash into a mountain in Croatia, and it uh, has shaken up all of us. I was at one funeral this morning that was Ron Brown's that many of you saw uh, yesterday. So I think we've all thought a lot, not so much about the particulars of public policy this week, but about uh, what public service means and uh, how tragic it is to lose the people who do it well and uh, do it with so much caring. I'd like to talk this evening, get you thinking a bit, about a really basic question, like what should our federal government do? What should it be, what, uh, what should its role be in making America a more satisfying place to live? Now, we might argue a bit about what we mean by a satisfying place to live, but I don't propose to get into that tonight. Let's assume that we all share pretty much the same uh, vision for our country, that we want at least a gradually rising standard of living for most people, uh, that we want safe streets and clean air and clean water. We want opportunities for people to work who work hard to get an education, to find a job, to get a better one, to own a home, to live in a decent neighborhood. 
We want people to be responsible and self-reliant, but we also want there to be caring and responsive assistance for those who need help in adversity. And the question is, given this shared vision, what can the federal government do to bring it about? Now, that's not an idle academic question. It's a real dilemma faced by a presidential candidate, including the one I work for. What should he say he wants the federal government to do? And if elected or reelected, uh, how, uh, what will he try to get it to do? What can he promise that he might actually be able to deliver? Now, despite a lot of current po political rhetoric, the relevant question, as everyone at the Kennedy School knows, is not really more or less or small government versus big government. Hardly anybody honestly wants either one. Imagine, if you will, a presidential candidate of stereotypical anti-government views who claims he wants the government to do a whole lot less. So far, so good. The audience cheers. He says he wants to slash taxes and stop handouts to the poor and uh, foreign aid. And he gets more cheers. But then he moves on to the programs that help almost everybody directly at some time just during their lives, like student loans and Social Security and Medicare, and the cheering stops. People start worrying. They worry about their kids and their grandmothers and themselves. And if he goes on to advocate eliminating small business loans or dismantling environmental regulations or closing down national parks or not repairing the, internet, the interstate highways or weakening the armed forces, he finds himself all alone on the stage and the once cheering throngs are heading for the exits. Now, in some parts of the country, such a candidate could get elected to Congress, and quite a few did in 1994. <laughs> but I submit that such a candidate could not get elected president. He or she would have a hard time even winning a, pre a Republican presidential primary in a pretty conservative state. He'd get plenty of support for the anti-government rhetoric, but as soon as he got to specifics, his ratings would plummet. Because the truth is that most Americans actually like the specifics of what the federal government does for them, even though they applaud those who attack the federal government in the abstract. Now, on the other side, one can imagine a stereotypical big-spending liberal candidate who advocates higher taxes, especially on the rich, to pay for benefits for just about everybody. But such candidates, and I haven't met one in years, don't get nominated for president anymore, even in Democratic primaries in places like Massachusetts. Most Americans don't want to pay higher taxes, except possibly for very specific benefits, and they don't believe that federal spending programs are the answers to what ails America now. So Americans don't want either a big or a small government in the abstract. They want a government that works, one that responds to what they see as the serious problems. The rhetoric of big and small government only obscures this real question of what government should do and how it should do it. And that question is a serious one for a thoughtful presidential candidate who wants to appeal to the broad range of concerned voters, the people who think their lives could be a lot better than they are now, and that the president ought somehow to be able to help. Now, obviously, presidential candidates always have this problem, but sometimes it's harder than others. The problem is relatively easy when there's some big problem on the minds of many voters that could arguably be solved or at least ameliorated by passing a federal law creating a new federal institution or funding a federal program. Or when there's some serious national problem like threats to the peace or to the stability of the economy that can only be addressed by Washington. The problem is hard right now precisely because most of the problems that the federal government can fix by itself have been fixed. At least the tools for fixing them are in place and operating pretty effectively. The economy is humming along with high, un with high employment and relatively low inflation. The world is more or less at peace in a highly sophisticated, well-trained, demonstrably reliable military force stands ready to protect us from any enemies that might emerge. Air and water are cleaner than they once were and toxic waste less hazardous. 
When disaster occurs, flood, earthquake, a tragic bomb blast, federal relief and rescue efforts are prompt and effective. The Social Security system is ensuring that most older Americans have a decent income and a dignified independent old age, while Medicare ensures their access to an increasingly sophisticated health system. Credit is widely available. Financial institutions are fairly safe and sound. The problems that could be solved and have been solved by passing a federal law or setting up a new institution uh, just aren't there uh, anymore. They haven't been solved perfectly, but certainly well enough so that they're not high on the voters' worries list. Now, the problems that are high on worry lists, the problems that Americans face now, and they're serious, aren't the kind that the federal government can fix with a law or a program. Uh, these problems, rising inequality, low productivity, low-wage jobs, crime, violence, racial conflict, teenage pregnancy, dysfunctional neighborhoods, are problems that can only be solved, if they can be solved, by a widespread outpouring of community energy and concern reinforced by the joint efforts of schools and churches, businesses and unions, governments at all levels. What's needed is a bottom-up revolution in which groups of citizens in localities all over the country come together to identify what they believe is most necessary to revitalize their community and work together to make it happen. And a presidential candidate has the problem that he can't promise such a revolution. He can only show that he understands the problems on most people's minds. He can urge them to energize the kind of community effort needed to address these problems and he can promise modest federal assistance to reinforce what individuals and communities want to do for themselves. Now, economic policy is, I think, the best example, but not the only one, of my basic thesis that the problems the national government can reasonably be expected to solve, in this case, avoidance of recession and inflation, are under good control, at least for the moment, leaving the much harder problems, the slow productivity growth and the rising inequality, which can't be solved by the federal government easily, quickly, or alone. For at least a half a century, the voting public has held the federal government responsible for warding off both unemployment and inflation and has punished presidents who failed to deliver. The 1992 presidential campaign focused heavily on the economy, partly on the underlying long-run problems, but mostly on the two most immediate and fixable difficulties. One was the anemic jobless recovery from the recession of 1990, and the other was the soaring budget deficit that was saddling taxpayers with escalating debt service costs, putting upward pressure on interest rates, and threatening the long-run investment needed for future economic growth. Candidate Clinton promised to turn both problems around in the, at the same time. He was rashly specific, promising to create 8 million new jobs in four years and cut the deficit in half simultaneously. Those were breathtaking commitments, and there were those on his campaign staff, people I know very well now, uh, who feared that the candidate was over-promising and might rue the day that he had been so explicit. Nevertheless, seven months before the November 1996 election, these promises have been kept. More than 8 million more people were working in early 1996 uh, than in early 1993. The net number of new jobs created uh, since the beginning of the administration seems likely to exceed 9 million by midsummer. Moreover, increasingly the new jobs are good jobs, disproportionately in higher wage occupations and industries. Unemployment, which was 7.1% in 1993, has been hovering around 5.6% for more than a year, a lower level than many economists in this university and others thought was sustainable and without any clear sign of accelerating inflation. Profits, stock prices reflect the generally strong performance of the economy at the aggregate level, though not in the last three days. As a member of the economic team that labored hard uh, to put together President Clinton's 1993 deficit reduction package and defended in the Congress, I'm personally particularly gratified at the administration's spectacular success in reducing the deficit. Even with a Democratic Congress, that package was a hard sell. 
No one enjoys voting to cut spending or raise taxes, and the Clinton plan required both in equal measure. It was designed to cut $500 billion off the cumulative de deficit over five years, half by reducing projected spending and half by raising projected revenues, though with hindsight it cut more than that. And there were dire predictions, which make interesting reading uh, after the fact, uh, that the proposal would throw the economy into recession and that the deficit reduction targets could not be met. The package passed by one vote in each house, but it passed and it worked. The deficit, which was $290 billion in uh, fiscal year 1992 and headed up, was down to $164 billion in 1995 and is projected by my former colleagues at the Congressional Budget Office, and you know how good they are, uh, at $141 billion for 1996. Now, if that's roughly right, and how wrong can it be when the year is half over, the President will have fulfilled his pledge uh, to cut the deficit in half in four years. In, indeed, in relation to the economy, which is the right way to measure the impact of the deficit, uh, it has already fallen by more than half, from 5 percent of the GDP to about 2.3 percent. It's likely to be under 2 percent this year, a lower deficit than most countries, even most industrial countries, uh, have achieved in recent years. Moreover, uh, in the last few months, a very remarkable thing has happened. Both the President and the leadership of the Congress, Republican and Democrat, have converged on the same fiscal policy goal measured by the same standard. Everybody's committed now to balancing the budget by 2002 using the fairly conservative economic projections of my former colleagues at the CBO. Now, this convergence on a single fiscal policy goal has been submerged in the cacophony of partisan wrangling over how to achieve the goal, but it's worth some attention from Washington watchers. Much of the 1980s, you will all remember, were spent disputing whether the balance in the budget was a worthy objective. Supply-siders said deficits didn't matter. President Reagan said not to worry, we'd grow out of it. President Bush agreed reluctantly to a deficit reduction deal, quite a good one actually, and then repudiated it. Only a year ago, our own administration, despite its enormous success in deficit reduction, was uncertain in the aftershock of the 1994 election whether to commit to the painful additional measures necessary to get to balance. And only a few months ago, Republicans and Democrats were arguing loudly about how fast to balance the budget, seven years, nine years, ten years, and what assumptions to use in assessing the policies necessary to get there. Now, that's all behind us. For better or worse, uh, we have this remarkable phenomenon of everybody's focused on the same goal. Now, to be sure, uh, just agreeing on the goal doesn't solve the problem. The President and the Republican leadership propose different ways of getting to the goal. The Republicans want a large tax cut offset by a larger reduction in uh, projected spending, especially for Medicare and Medicaid and education, uh, than the administration believes is either wise or necessary. The contrast between the two plans started out very stark but it narrowed considerably in the marathon negotiations that went on in December and January in the Cabinet Room and the Oval Office. Those were remarkable negotiations, and they came very close. Uh, all of us were very disappointed when it didn't come to closure. Uh, we thought it would. When the Republicans broke off the negotiations uh, to get into the primaries, uh, we uh, believed that they would come back uh, and that we would close the deal. I still believe there is hope that this will happen. So does the President. The good news, then, is that by all the usual aggregative statistical measures, inflation, unemployment, profits, etc., even the budget deficit, the economy is functioning as well as it has in decades and better than most industrial economies. The current combination of monetary and fiscal policy, perhaps with a good measure of good luck, is producing close to optimal macroeconomic results, and there's no present reason to think that the economy is likely to veer off track in the future. But the bad news is that the fundamental problems of wage stagnation and increasing income inequality 
also prominent concerns of the 1992 campaign, have not been solved by the macroeconomic improvement, as there was no reasonable to expectation to think they would be. Few Americans expressed the optimism about the economy that matched the positive macroeconomic statistics. Polls, press, pundits all confirm the widespread anxiety and pessimism. Many people feel they're struggling to maintain a decent standard of living, that their jobs are insecure, that their children's chances of living the American dream are bleaker than their own. And the supporting evidence is abundant. Slow growth in fa real family incomes, a widening gap between re rich and poor, whole segments of the population, those with low skills and little education, falling behind, not only relatively, uh, but absolutely, Young people with only a high school education or less than one, unable to earn as much as their parents earned, unable to look forward to buying a house or raising a family in a safe neighborhood. And the economic worries blur into the social ones, crime, drugs, violence, family and community disintegration. The problem for, the, for a president and for all of us is that these concerns cannot be addressed with the tools of macroeconomic policy Although it must be remembered uh, that the failure of monetary and fiscal policy to keep the economy on the track, a serious recession or accelerating re inflation could make them a whole lot worse. Moreover, they can't be solved quickly and they can't be solved by the federal government alone. A presidential candidate can promise he will work hard on these problems. Candidate Clinton did and President Clinton has, but he sure can't promise he will solve them. What would help most over the long run would probably be a major improvement in the skills of the labor force brought about by more people getting more and better education and training. The federal government can play a role here. It can encourage more students to continue their education beyond high school by providing student aid in the form of loans and grants. It can provide extra resources for preschool education for enriching classroom instruction in school systems with concentrations of children from low-income families. It can challenge states to set goals for their students and help them train teachers in more effective methods of reaching those goals. It can encourage states to make the transition from school to work smoother for those not going to college, a weak link in American education. It can consolidate the long list of federally funded training programs and empower dislocated workers to seek the training best suited for them by putting a voucher in their hands and holding training institutions accountable for results. The Clinton administration has, in fact, fought hard for all of these programs, trying to increase their, fu their funding and fend off the cuts and to make them more effective. But be realistic. The federal government does not control local schools and provides only a fraction of local funding for elementary and secondary education. Federal programs will make a lasting difference only if they energize parents, students, teachers, business, and community leaders to seize control of their own institutions and radically increase their commitment to quality outcomes. The federal government has no effective tr tools for orchestrating a community revolution. A blueprint from Washington to be rigidly followed would be a disaster. So what can they do? Incidentally, I take as a given that Americans don't want a top-down revolution. They don't want the federal government moving in and taking over their school system or their local police force or anything else. They don't want aggressive national intervention in neighborhoods, even the dysfunctional crime-ridden neighborhoods in many big cities, the ones that look like they've been through a devastating war. So politically aggressive intervention isn't worth serious discussion. It certainly isn't anything that a presidential candidate could even hint at. Uh, most Americans fear big government, and nobody thinks large-scale federal intervention would work. It's worth pausing for a moment to ask why the audiences always cheer when the speaker bashes the government, even though they stop cheering when he threatens to cut out what the government actually does. I'm not talking about audiences made up of the kind of extremists who form militias and worry about black helicopters bringing troops uh, from the UN to take over Cheyenne. Even sophisticated policy audiences like this one are likely to have pretty negative reactions to the abstract notion of federal government. 
I doubt the current frenzy of government bashing has much to do with anything the government actually has done or not done. It's true that dealing with the government is perceived as a hassle. The rules and the forms are too complicated. The desire to avoid hassle accounts for the popularity of the flat tax, especially in mid-April. It's, it's not the flatness of the tax, the lack of product, uh, progressivity that appeals so much, except to rich people. It's the simplicity. People like the idea that they could pay their tax by filling out a postcard, even if they didn't save money. And that's why the Clinton administration has been working hard to simplify forms and to make res regulation uh, more user-friendly. It's also true that government programs are perceived as wasteful and ineffective, uh, from which some draw the conclusion that government should do as little as possible. My own observation is that the inefficiency stereotype is mostly wrong. Where the mission is clear and the job is doable, federal institutions are about as efficient as private ones, and they're getting better. The armed forces, the social security system, the National Park Service, the FBI, the National Institutes of Health are full of dedicated, hardworking people, many of them educated at the Kennedy School, who do their jobs well and deliver their services effectively. They're weaker agencies, outmoded systems, examples of managerial mistakes, but they don't dominate the picture. Moreover, the managerial revolution spearheaded by the Vice President's National Performance Review is gradually transforming government as it has transformed many American businesses. Delayering, decentralizing, emphasize, emphasis on uh, customer service, empowering frontline workers, measuring results, increasing cost effectiveness are all part of the government manager's lingo and kit of tools, and they're making a difference. We're not the only country doing this. I recently chaired a ministerial level meeting at the OECD in Paris in which a very wide range of governments uh, shared their experience, and it was interesting experience, uh, in what they are doing to make government work better. But uh, in, in addition, constrained budgets uh, like corporate losses powerfully focus the managerial mind the painful cuts <clears throat> necessary to reduce the deficit and get the budget on track to balance are forcing not only managerial reforms, but abandonment of low priority objectives. Now, I'm an economist and not a social psychologist, but I suspect that the current vogue for government bashing is mostly symptomatic of individual anxiety in the face of change insecurity in the face of bewildering technology and the blizzard of information. It reflects feelings of powerlessness and lack of control over one's destiny and grasping for someone or something to blame. If things aren't going well, blame the government. If powerless, powerlessness is the root of the problem, then the argument leads back to the same point. What America needs most is a resurgence of individual and community confidence, a return to the days when people had no choice but to get together with their neighbors and solve their problems. It needs a rebirth of the perhaps partly mythical spirit of the frontier, the spirit of let's build a church, let's build a school, let's get together and replace the barn that burned down. And if that's the problem, that we need a constructive bottom-up revolution, then we come back to what can the federal government do. Now, one possible federal response is get out of the way. Devolve the responsibility to state and local government in, for these things that are closest to home. In a book I wrote about four years ago that Joe referred to very generously, I called this option dividing the job. The basic notion was that the federal government should concentrate on government functions that could be done only or best centrally and leave the rest to state and local government. I argued that the federal government should focus its attention on three kinds of activities. The nation's interface with the rest of the world, an increasingly absorbing and complicated problem, defense, diplomacy, trade, Second, solving the problems that clearly transcend or drift across state boundaries and cannot be addressed adequately by states acting individually, air traffic control, air and water pollution. 
And third, social insurance and related income transfers, in which I would include some kind of national health insurance. The federal government then would get out of the business of providing the kinds of services that depend for their success on community effort, involvement, and initiative, including ed elementary and secondary education, housing, economic development, social services. Now, dividing the job requires a way of equalizing revenues or sharing taxes in a redistributive way so that less affluent states and communities aren't forced to have substandard schools or other public services. But we could do that. A number of countries do, uh, and uh, we could do it too. The advantage of the division of responsibility is that it clarifies for the public who's in charge and who to hold accountable. It could energize the bottom-up revolution by making it impossible to look to Washington for help or to blame Washington for failure in a broad range of crucial services, including education. People would know if they wanted better schools, safer streets, more livable neighborhoods, they had better mobilize at the local and state level and make it happen. Now, I still think that dividing the job makes some sense, uh, but as I have worked for a president, I have realized that devolution has a big drawback for our presidential candidate or indeed for a sitting president. It doesn't give him anything to talk about. <laughs> Except in war or recession, which you're not in at the moment, or when something scandalous is going on, say in the social security system, the candidate couldn't talk about what he would do to solve the problems that Americans are most concerned about. A big obstacle to a firm division of labor between central and state and local functions is precisely that in normal times, the things people care most about are local. They care about schools and neighborhood decay and crime and gangs and the availability and quality of local jobs. Now, before the telecommunications revolution, when national campaigns were remote and Washington was far away from most people's home or farm, it may have been okay to let the president do foreign policy, be commander in chief and build a few canals, while the state and local officials took charge of what really mattered to people. But now the candidate flits around by jet and is on the tube in everybody's living room almost every night. And that's true when he's president as well. He can't just talk about foreign affairs. He has to be relevant to everybody's life. He can't just defend what's working well. He has to talk about the problems people feel aren't being solved. He needs to get high marks for empathy and speaking to the individual's or the community's particular pain. President Clinton got his most positive ratings in his last State of the Union for talking about some of the least presidential subjects, like school uniforms. School uniforms? That's a presidential matter? Uh, but people can relate to school uniforms. Uh, and it is symbolic of the point uh, that I'm making. They like the president to be talking about something they understand and that matters to them. So the telecommunications revolution has profoundly changed the nature of campaigning and governing in ways that make devolution and dividing the job more difficult. Presidents and cabinet officers now have the capacity to communicate directly and almost continuously with governors and mayors, police chiefs, school superintendents, groups of citizens interested in almost every aspect of public life. These officials, groups, and individuals don't want Washington running their lives, but they don't want to be ignored either. They want national officials relating to and helping them with their problems. So that is in the problem that we have been wrestling with. We all need to think creatively about a new relationship between the federal government to, uh, and these in, inherently community-based issues. We don't, need, we don't think uh, that uh, the current one is working very well. There is this enormous animosity, some of it uh, engendered by the fact that uh, the federal government's uh, efforts to help 
uh, have, uh, have been too complicated, too much rulemaking, too much interference in people's lives. Uh, so we need some new mode of the federal government relating to community effort. How can the federal government act as a cheerleader, maybe even as a supportive coach in community efforts to try to improve schools and neighborhoods and the quality of life without trying to be the rule maker or the ball carrier? Now, we've spent a lot of effort and discussion and experiments in the last uh, three years of the Clinton administration on trying to devise new kinds of relationships between the federal government and uh, localities or communities. We have developed something we call performance partnerships, meaning uh, instead of a whole bunch of categorical grants, you put together a uh, group of programs with the same general objective and say to the community, let's sit down together, develop a set of uh, measurable objectives, and then you use the federal money any way you want to uh, to get uh, to uh, those objectives. A related concept is empowerment zones and uh, communities. Uh, the federal government picking out an area, giving some special uh, incentives uh, to uh, development of a plan uh, and uh, some uh, special money, tax breaks or federal money uh, going with carrying out the plan. There is the Oregon idea or what's known in Washington as the Oregon idea of uh, a, uh, because it started in Oregon, of a state uh, trying to uh, put uh, together its own plan and benchmarks and uh, things that it would like to accomplish, not only to uh, prioritize its own resources, but to enable it then with its associated cities and counties uh, to come to the federal government and say, here's what we're trying to do. Uh, don't give us a whole bunch of rules and spe separate programs. Uh, help us do, help us reach our own benchmarks. There are a variety of these ideas and they have in common that the unit is the place, Henry Cisneros likes to call this place-based government, that the goals are set by the community in partnership with the federal government, that they're explicit, uh, that they're measurable, and that they're rewarded in some sense. That the means and the methods of getting to the goals are flexible as uh, long as the results are attained and the bureaucratic rules and the forms are supposed to go away. These concepts are experimental and they're a lot more complex than dividing the job, which was a simple, neat idea. We don't have a formula yet, and there may, there may be no formula, but if I'm right that what America needs most is a resurgence of community energy and a new confidence in the ability of people to come together and to solve their problems, then the biggest challenge for aspiring leaders at the federal level is to find new mechanisms for working and relating to the needs of communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. We have on the floor here two microphones, and uh, we'll take questions alternating between the two. Let me start on this side, Lizzie. What, sorry, why don't we let, ask people to introduce themselves so Alice knows who's talking to you. I know who you are, but she doesn't. <laughs> okay. um, Leslie Goodman, I'm a fellow here at the IOP, and in my real life, I'm Deputy Chief of Staff to Governor Pete Wilson. Um, thank you for being here and, and thank you for your devotion to deficit reduction because I truly believe without you this administration would have a far smaller commitment to the cause. But my question um, relates to the budget and the negotiations. Um, initially it seemed that the President was reluctant to even create a balanced budget using CBO numbers. And I wonder if um, maybe you could shed a little bit of light on that as to why he had that reluctance and perhaps secondarily if you believe that he is committed to a budget deal. Perhaps you could give us maybe three reasons why you think it's important for the President 
politics aside, to strike a deal on the budget if the economy is doing well and eight million new jobs have been created and things are going along rather smoothly? Uh, sure. Let me start with the, uh, the end of the question, uh, why it's important to finish the job. Uh, we've got the, the budget deficit uh, coming down. Uh, why is it important to do the rest, go the rest of the way? Uh, I think for the same reason that it was important to start, uh, namely that uh, running big deficits in the federal budget uh, uh, year after year in good times uh, is just draining our savings uh, into financing the government. And uh, if we can uh, get the deficit, the structural deficit, uh, down to the neighborhood of zero, it doesn't have to be exactly zero, but to down to the neighborhood of zero, then uh, uh, it uh, puts downward pressure on interest rates. It's good for private investment. Uh, it's uh, generally healthy for the long-run uh, growth of the economy. Uh, so why didn't we do a, a balanced budget uh, in, uh, a year uh, when, we, when we did, uh, well, the, the first budget after the 94 election? Um, I think partly because everybody was in shock and didn't uh, know what they, uh, uh, how, to, how to react uh, to this new situation and uh, was very fearful that uh, putting a, a particularly a new health plan on the table uh, would uh, simply uh, be used against us. And uh, so we, we talked about it a lot. And uh, it's not true that we didn't express the goal of balancing the budget. Uh, we did. The president talked about it a lot. Uh, and he uh, recognized that uh, to get to a balanced budget would require a new try at uh, cutting uh, into the uh, growth of uh, Medicare and Medicaid. And we, and we said, we want to do that. We want to work with the Congress on it. But we're not prepared to put a, to, uh, to put a plan on the table. On. My name is James, and I've been attending a study group here at the Institute of Politics led by Lynn Williams, former president of the Steelworkers, and the opinions expressed are, are entirely my own. Um, <laughs> I'm sure, you know, he, he would probably appreciate that. Uh, I, uh, yesterday's New York Times had an article underneath the article about the Unabomber, a little sort of one of those little tie-ins to, you know, turn inside the page such and such that the Joint Chiefs, I'm, I'm not sure I have this exactly right, are requesting an additional $12 billion, was it? Um, and uh, already the military budget is in excess, if I'm not mistaken, by $6 billion uh, to what was thought to be appropriate by the Clinton administration. Uh, I hate to bring up the uh, long since forgotten peace dividend, uh, but don't you agree that we are spending way too much money on the military in this country and that we need to pay serious attention to this matter before our country totally disintegrates? Uh, no, actually, I don't. Uh, I think we are spending about the right amount on the military uh, and uh, that we really need a relatively small uh, by our past standards, uh, but very technologically sophisticated and very ready force. Could we have it somewhat cheaper? Maybe a little. But uh, I, I'm very impressed with uh, the uh, assiduousness with which the uh, Pentagon has downsized, as we say, uh, over the last uh, several years in the wake of the, uh, uh, of the end of the Cold War. And uh, I think we're on about the right track. Now, uh, do the chiefs want more? Uh, in their heart of hearts, they probably do. Uh, but I think the New York Times uh, uh, article was very misleading. It seemed to have been the product of a reporter going around or perhaps committee uh, staff going around saying, if you had a lot more money, would you be able to spend it? And then adding up the results. Now, uh, if you ask a university dean if he had a lot more money, would he be able to spend it? I think he'd say yes. Uh, anybody would. <laughs> but, I mean, do you think the $260 billion is small? <clears throat> um, it, kind of small, not small. Uh, it's uh, a, not a very large percentage of our GDP. Now, you can argue this both ways. You can say, uh, it's larger that we have a larger military, better equipped military force by a whole lot than uh, any other nation in the world. Uh, and uh, who who's going to attack us? 
On the other hand, uh, we have used this force, not to its full extent, uh, but uh, we used it in the Gulf War. Uh, we're using a significant piece of it now in Bosnia. I think those are things we need to be prepared to do and do well. Sabine Kaiser, I'm a student at the Kennedy School from Germany. My question relates to unemployment and job creation. Um, you group job creation as one of the solvable tasks of governments, and this administration has done a remarkable job. So which recommendations do you give to governments on the other side of the Atlantic who are doing a pretty miserable job and who would probably say it's not quite solvable for governments? Also with respect to them now thinking whether they should tackle unemployment at an even more federal level, i.e. the level of the European Union. A very good question. It's hard enough to, av to advise one's own government, though, uh, uh, let, al let alone uh, others. Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, the, uh, the trade-offs that have been made in Europe have, uh, have uh, been in favor of uh, letting unemployment uh, be higher uh, and uh, taking less uh, risks on inflation. Uh, that may not be the right trade-off. Hi, my name is. My name isn't, <clears throat> but my name is uh, Ben Kahn, and I'm a student at the Kennedy School. And I am happy to hear about, uh, hear you talking about energizing communities. But I'm concerned about this hypothesis that moving away from central government and moving towards local and state government accomplishes that in reality. I'm concerned about um, the, uh, the other hypothesis that organized, well-financed political interests have an easier time dominating local and state politics than they do dominating presidential politics. They can influence the Congress a lot. They can dominate local and state politics a lot. But the presidential elections have traditionally, and internationally, and other countries also tend to be um, a very democratizing force in a country, countervailing against financial, financially more powerful interests and more organized interests. So this I, I'm, I wanted to ask you to um, speak about this other hypothesis and also to t uh, explain why the Democratic Party has moved further and further towards the Republicans' tendency to look at state and local government as this community energizing force rather than a possible community dampening force and, and why the Democratic Party has relinquished its traditional um, standing up for mechanisms that countervail against financial interests in the presidential. I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to, what I, what I want to focus on is how, I want to ask you to focus on is how withdrawing the president and the federal government from social services well, in the first place, I don't think I said that. I said, I said that I said we got a problem. We don't, I don't think the kinds of things that need to be done can be done by passing federal laws or making federal rules. That's where I start. And uh, so I, I think the problem is how do you energize communities uh, to start solving their own problems, and then the federal government can help this, so the, but so it the basis, can't do it. The basis of what you're saying is pessimism about what federal laws can do yeah. to facilitate community energizing. That's right. Um, uh, it, really, it really is. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I, this, all these programs like Head Start and Title I and even Goals 2000, which are really specifically directed toward getting, getting the uh, states to, to energize themselves, to set standards, uh, those are all fine, but they don't work uh, unless there's something really coming up from the bottom. Uh, and uh, so and the, the, and the federal government can't yeah. facilitate that. It can facilitate it, but it can't make it happen. Now the question is, uh, what? How can it facilitate it most? Which is what I was trying to address in my lecture. And I think uh, what we've been str struggling with are sort of two models. Uh, one is the devolution model, which I started out being for, really, uh, of thinking that uh, getting out of the way was pretty important and making the federal government concentrate on some things and, and uh, the communities on others would make it clearer and make things more, make the uh, uh, 
local and states are more accountable. Uh, but I'm, I think there's, there are a lot of drawbacks to that. And uh, so we've been focusing on some new kinds of relationships, this sort of direct Washington to the place kind of partnership. Uh, I don't think we've got it right yet. This is a big experiment. I'm not even sure it's the way to go. Uh, but it might be. It, uh, but the, the decision making, the energizing, and the setting of goals, I think, has got to come from the community itself. It can't be imposed by the feds. Dr. Rivlin, Ron Langston from Des Moines, Iowa. How are you? Hi, nice to see you. <laughs> um, I have a question that, uh, um, that I would like your kind of retrospective view about. Uh, the Congress and the President and about Republicans and Democrats. As I listen to your speech and as I observe the scene, thinking in time and using analogies as a kind of a basis of this, uh, it, it sounds very much like there's not a great deal of spread or difference on various issues regarding to balancing the budget, to local control, school districts having more authority, making decisions at the local level. Can you retrospectively tell me then what, what has happened, what changed as to why the President and the Congress are at odds and why we have shutdowns in government? What happened? Can you step back a few paces and if we're so close on so many things, why is there such divide? Well, in the first place, the things we're divided of, we aren't even talking about the basic issue. We aren't even arguing with the Republicans mostly about the uh, basic issues that I've been raising tonight. We've been raising about how much money for this or that in existing programs. Uh, so it's worse than you say, uh, in a sense. Uh, but um, I think that, you know, elementary civics kind of thing that uh, we haven't had in my lifetime uh, this experience, a Democratic president and a Republican Congress, and a Republican Congress that came in full of itself and how it was going to do things differently and it was going to take over and it wasn't going to listen to this president and they forgot this other little thing in the Constitution about how we had the veto power and they didn't have two-thirds. And uh, we've sort of been hung up on that, but not um, I'm always an optimist. I think we will get a 1996 budget. I mean it after all, it's April, but uh, <laughs> I think we'll have a 1996 budget finished up next week. Uh, we, and uh, I think uh, there's still a reasonable hope for the, uh, for the longer uh, budget deal. Uh, we uh, sat in the uh, Oval Office, and, uh, or the President sat, I stood, uh, in the uh, <laughs> on Tuesday while he signed uh, the uh, item, uh, item veto. Uh, so, you know, it isn't, it isn't all uh, at loggerheads, but uh, we, this, this divided government is a rough thing to do. Hi, I'm John Saldana, uh, visiting scholar at the HIAD, and uh, uh, I'm an East Timorese. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, just my personal opinion. Uh, a couple of days ago, I, I saw an, an article in the New York Times uh, written by uh, Secretary General of the UN, Butros Butros Ghali, stating about that the U.S. topped the list of um, being the debtor of the UN budget. And uh, I would like to get your reaction. What do you think, uh, what the current thinking in, the, in, the, in, the, in D.C., looking at the UN a role in the world or, or in, in involving engaging in, in uh, conflict resolution around the world. Is that, is that going to be diminished because of that reason that why U.S. already been, I mean, uh, did not pay it, its debt to the U.N. or? Thanks. Well, I can give you my opinion and, and the administration's. Uh, uh, we think it's dreadful. I mean, we, we ought to be pay, paying our debts. Uh, Madeleine Albright likes to say that she doesn't like representing a deadbeat nation. Uh, and I can see why she doesn't. Uh, this is, uh, it's, uh, it's scandalous, it's ridiculous, I don't know what st uh, stronger words to use, that a nation as rich as ours, uh, with the stake that we have in the good performance of international organizations, isn't paying its dues. Uh, now, uh, going up there and saying that to the Congress, uh, which we do, uh, is, uh, is not getting the money done. And uh, I think we're, again, we're making progress. Uh, we will, I think, in the uh, budget that's worked out for 96, uh, pay uh, a, a, the, uh, 
peacekeeping and international organizations uh, dues. And then we won't pay the arrears, however, to the UN. Uh, we are hoping to work out uh, in 97, in the context of the 97 budget, uh, a schedule for payment of the arrears over several years uh, that uh, the Congress will agree to. And I think, again, there's good hope for this. But I, the spirit of your question, I couldn't agree more. Hi, I'm Dean Kaplan. I'm a mid-career student from 1991 here for the Alumni Weekend, so I'm glad you're here. Um, one of the penalties of standing online is you think of more questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, Take the best one. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, sh a, short, a short thought and a, and a, and a short question. Um, one is that w I, I applaud the idea you have of the partnership between the federal uh, government and the localities. Uh, speaking as a city official uh, in, in a beleaguered, fairly beleaguered city, Philadelphia, uh, one of the things I've noticed in our dealings with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and some of our surrounding communities is that when you say that the federal government cannot solve these problems, I agree wholeheartedly, but my sense is that a lot of them don't even know they have a problem. Uh, and certainly when we frequently talk to them, they're not, certainly they're not aware that we have a problem. In some cases, particularly in suburban communities, there are whole areas, uh, particularly if you, if you are a Democrat, where they, they think they don't have a, a, an issue that actually exists for them. But my, my original question before, before standing here was that once long, long ago, um, the, one, of the, one of the small pieces of fixing the budget problem was to move the federal government to a capital budget. Um, and while some argue that it was a gimmick and argue that it would be a problem, particularly in the DOD area, others thought that it was reasonable to pay for long-term assets with long-term borrowing. Uh, that seems to have fallen out of the picture uh, in the budget solution uh, uh, for us, and I'm wondering if you could comment briefly on whether that's something that might eventually return or we should, uh, should not really be a part of the federal uh, uh, budget deficit solution. Well, I'm for making decisions about capital projects in a more rational way than, uh, than an organized way than we do, and collecting those in, uh, so that you can see them in the budget and uh, can decide about which ones should have priority. Uh, but I, do, I don't think uh, that uh, segregating the capital projects and saying uh, we borrow for those and uh, not for anything else uh, is actually a very sensible rule for federal fiscal policy. Uh, mostly because it's very hard to define what is a federal, pro uh, what is a capital project at the federal level. Uh, most of the, if you define it as sort of hardware and buildings, most of it's military. And, uh, I, and if you go on to what are you really, to the investment type, type decision, what is it that we're doing that uh, is going to contribute to a higher GDP in the future, then you get into education and a whole lot of other things, but it gets very hard to measure the connection between what you're spending and what actually happens. So uh, I think it's a nice idea, but not much help. Thanks. Uh, my name is John Francis. Uh, I'm both a former member of the Bureau of the Budget and of the Office of Management and Budget. And I was uh, glad to be there recently on your celebration of the 25th anniversary that, of OMB. That was a fun occasion. <laughs> yeah, and I came down and visited you in your office just a while ago. Uh, I can't imagine what's happening at the Bureau now. When I was there, and we moved from the Johnson administration to the Nixon administration, and we did uh, four budgets that year. I can't imagine what you're going through now, because uh, we didn't get sleep then, but I can imagine that you get no sleep at all now. The question is, though, I've been thinking about this Social Security. Uh, what is the general thought now on the private, partial privatization of Social Security? Um, well, you're right about the no sleep. I mean, do <laughs> <laughs> continuous budgeting is not not a uh, recipe for uh, running a, a, an organization that gets any sleep at all. Uh, but uh, on privatizing Social Security, I think partly depends what you mean by it. Uh, there clearly, uh, and this is a post-election issue, but clearly post-election, we are going to be having a lot of discussion about the long-run future and structure of uh, Social Security. And uh, some of the things that will be talked about and are, are already being talked about because uh, they're in various reports, there's a report coming out uh, uh, very soon, if it, or maybe it's already out, of the advi an advisory commission uh, on Social Security uh, that talks about several different kinds uh, of uh, uh, privatization 
uh, that might occur in the future and what the pros and cons are. Uh, it's a question of partly do you want, do you mean by that is the federal government uh, simply running the present system but investing part of the funds in uh, uh, the private markets, which uh, may have some pluses but has some uh, nervous making downside as well. Uh, and or do you mean that uh, you'd kind of divide the social security system and have a basic system which was social insurance and that let everybody have a 401k on top of that? Uh, that's a more direct kind of privatizing. Uh, again, I think there are pluses and minuses on that, and I suspect we're going to have a lot of debate on it. Thank you. Yes, my name is Bruce Kennedy. I'm a mid-career student here. And um, on the seven-year deficit uh, reduction package, critics have pointed out that um, most of the reductions are going to take place in the latter years of that program. And secondly, it's difficult enough to know what's happening in the economy this year, let alone what's going to happen seven years from now. And so they claim that this is a package of smoke and mirrors, and I'm wondering how you respond to that. Then secondly, if I can just slip this one in, in, your, res <laughs> in your response to the lady from Germany, you talked, you linked unemployment and uh, inflation as those two are inversely rela uh, related to one another. And I'm wondering if that is, in fact, your view, and if so, what is your rule of thumb of the appropriate level of unemployment? Ha! <laughs> <laughs> no, no prospective Federal Reserve board member uh, is going to answer that one. I even, I even got a little nervous talking about Germany. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, back to your, uh, to your first question. <laughs> You're absolutely right that no one can project the economy for seven years. You could, we, economists are not very good predictors. We never will be. Uh, the system is simply too complicated and too badgered from the outside. Uh, so the fact of life is that economic projections will al always be uncertain. On the other hand, you have to make policy, and you have to make policy on the basis of some commonly agreed on set of projections. And uh, that's why it's important to uh, have a set of projections that most people think is roughly right uh, in order to decide on the policy. And then if uh, the projections are not exactly right, it doesn't matter very much. At least you have a, 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 a single set on which you are saying, all right, we were agreed on these assumptions. Now, how should, what should we do about the policy? Should we cut Medicare more? Should we cut something else less? Uh, shall we have a bigger tax cut? So it's, it's a basis for having a sensible discussion, and is that it's a, it's a pretty good one. Uh, Backloading question. Uh, that much has been made of this, uh, but I think more than is really there. Uh, the, uh, if you look at both our plan and uh, the Republican plan, they're almost identical in terms of backloading in the sense that about 60% of the deficit reduction savings are in the last two years. Okay, going in position, that sounds terrible. Why aren't they evenly distributed across the seven years? But think about it a minute. What you're doing here is you're reducing a rate of growth. And uh, when you, you, the rate of growth of Medicare or Medicaid or whatever it is, if you reduce a rate of growth, it accumulates, uh, uh, it compounds. And uh, the savings have got to be uh, more heavily in the, uh, in the latter years, on top of which uh, the more saving you have, the less interest you pay, so that compounds and adds up in the, in the later years. Now, could we have gotten this so it was only 50% in the last two years? Probably. Could we have done much better than that? I don't think so. My name is Quentin Wilson. I'm with the Missouri Department of Economic Development. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for the help in making us look good over the last few years with economic growth in our state. <laughs> uh, we attribute a lot of that to the national economic policy. But now I'm going to come at this other question about the Federal Reserve from a different direction and see if we can trip you up. <laughs> I won't bite. The, uh, <laughs> I, was, I was afraid to say that. I'm uh, getting real good at this. <laughs> uh, well, two-part two question about uh, you going to the Federal Reserve. First of all, do you have any parting advice for the President and Congress about the urgency of dealing with the entitlement issue as a whole? Uh, and secondly, uh, do you expect that you and Lawrence Meyer, my fellow Missourian, as you go to the Fed, 
uh, will have any kind of a, an effect on the general Fed policy toward interest rates? Oh, sure. Uh, there are, Good. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think I'd have some effect. Uh, there are seven board members. Uh, they're, uh, they're a very interesting uh, group of people, and uh, we will, and, uh, we will uh, you know, I've, I'm not, I'm, I'll be the vice chair, which is a little more clout than, than, than average, but, uh, you know, any, any uh, seven-person board uh, has uh, a lot of interesting interaction, but uh, I certainly expect to have an effect. I don't expect to sit in the corner and, and uh, not say what I think. That's not been my, uh, my history. Uh, parting advice to, uh, to the President uh, and the Congress, uh, really um, get it done. Uh, and uh, I don't think on entitlements, uh, that's something that anybody needs to be preached to about. Uh, uh, it's, it's clear uh, as you work with the federal budget, uh, first place, if you're going to get the deficit to zero in, in uh, seven years, you've got to cut just about everything. Uh, but the big dollars are in uh, the, uh, the and the big growth uh, has been in the entitlement programs and especially in uh, the medical entitlement programs. Uh, so we've been arguing about how much to reduce the rate of growth in Medicare and Medicaid, but we sure haven't been arguing about whether to do it. Hi, my name is Monica Ehring. I was a mid-career student here in 1989, and I'm interested, and I work on the area of building the skills of the workforce, education and employment. Um, in most of the industrialized countries, business and government have some sort of partnership or collaborative relationship where they make joint investments in research and development and long-term policies that promote the skills of the workforce. Yet in this country, I've worked in states and communities all over this country, and I find a profound adversarial relationship between business and government and a lack of information about the kinds of skills that are needed for a globally competitive workforce in this country at the local level. What do you think the federal government can do, if anything, to change this kind of adversarial relationship and to make the information available to those who need it? It's a very good question, and it's one we've been working very hard on, and I don't pretend uh, that we have the answers. Uh, uh, with uh, respect to uh, the partnership on technology, uh, again, the, we've, we had various uh, kinds of uh, efforts, uh, a lot of it under the aegis of uh, Ron Brown at Commerce, uh, to, uh, to, to do joint kinds of, uh, of technological um, activities. And uh, one would have thought that would have been sort of a Republican thing, but they hate it, and they've been trying to, uh, uh, to close it down, uh, and I think we'll win on preserving some of it, but not all of it. Uh, with respect to the labor force, I think the way we have thought about the problem, um, partly it is uh, working on, on things that, uh, where you can involve businesses directly, as in the school-to-work program. Uh, but uh, the other is uh, really to, uh, to empower workers to get uh, the uh, training that they need. That, that uh, has seemed to us to be one way to go. Now, again, we may not get this through uh, the Congress, but to say, we've got all these federal training programs, let's put them together and in a pot and say, if, you're, if you lose your job, uh, you get a voucher that you can take to a uh, community college, a training school, whatever, as long as it's an accredited one with a track record that shows you what its, its uh, record is in, uh, in getting uh, effective training. That doesn't really answer your question because I think the cultural thing is there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brad Minnick and I'm a mid-career from 1986 here for the weekend. Uh, it struck me that when you were head of the Congressional Budget Office, the Republicans ran the OMB, and now that you run the OMB, the Republicans run the Congressional Budget Office. <laughs> and, and I'm curious, since process is such a big thing at the Kennedy School, um, what the difference is between advising a Congress and advising a president? And secondly, uh, what do you think from a process perspective about the way the Republicans are running the Congress, given that they haven't done that in 40 years? Uh, good questions. Uh, your premise isn't quite right. I was at CBO for eight years. Four, uh, four, four of them, there was a Democrat in the White House, and four, there was a Republican. Uh, but um, had, 
part of the problem on how the um, well, let me go deal with your other question first. Uh, what's the difference between advising the Congress and advising a president? Um, uh, there's a lot of difference in the, in, uh, the way it was structured. We structured it at, oh, at uh, CBO uh, so that we were giving nonpartisan advice. We thought that the way to have a credible institution, and, and uh, this was actually a decision I made when I first set it up, was uh, don't, give, uh, don't give recommendations. Just say you could do this or you could do that, and these are your advantages and these are the disadvantages, and try to do it as fairly as you can. And then you'll have everybody mad at you, but uh, you won't be seen as uh, uh, beholden to one party or another or trying to push one or the other. So uh, that was what we tried to do at CBO, I think, reasonably uh, successfully. And uh, I think the tradition carries on. Uh, it's uh, the other side, whichever other side it is, always says that the CBO is a captive of the majority party. Uh, but uh, I think they've stood their ground uh, pretty, pretty well. Uh, and obviously, when you work for president, you, you, you work for a very partisan person, and you're part of the team, and you give the advice that uh, you, uh, you hope will, uh, will help the president do the right thing and maybe win. So, uh, so that's very different. But with respect to how the Republicans are, are running the Congress, one the problem from the administration point of view is that uh, we don't know who's in charge, especially in the House. <laughs> Uh, and uh, much of the uh, problem of the negotiations, and perhaps ultimately the reason why they broke down, uh, was uh, the president didn't know who to negotiate with. He couldn't cut a deal uh, with Gingrich and know that he could deliver. So it's a problem. Hi, I'm Karen Handmaker. I was an MPP student in 83. Um, and I just returned from six years living in Hong Kong, where there is a flat tax and where health care is a lot simpler than it is here, and I work in health care. Is there any hope for the United States that these things can be more simple, understandable, user-friendly to the American citizen? It is an embarrassment, I think, to our country that our taxes are incomprehensible to people with master's degrees from the Kennedys. How does yep. that? <laughs> <laughs> to pick one at random, yes. <laughs> I mean, and of course, if you PhD abroad, in economics you doesn't do you any good either. <laughs> <laughs> but at, at our health care system, and, and, you know, and Medicaid, for example, on the plane today I was reading about, you know, Medicaid and managed care and Medicaid, and that. it's like the, it is incomprehensible. Why? Is it, and is it just because of political interest that these are hodgepodge systems that can never be changed? Is it because of the policy goals we seek to achieve because of these things? But it's... It's a mess. <laughs> it is. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, the, uh, I think with respect to the tax system, uh, there, uh, the problem is uh, that uh, over the years we have wanted to have uh, a, a fair tax system, and, uh, and we've wanted to, uh, to accomplish a lot of goals with the tax system, home ownership, for instance. Uh, you know, let the mortgage interest be deductible, but then, uh, you know, is uh, if you sell your home, you want it, to, this has to be fair, that has to be fair, you have to keep all these records. Uh, it, uh, I mean, quite apart from special interest stuff, uh, the regular things that most people are think are kind of a good idea, like mortgage interest deduction, uh, make, it, uh, make it more complicated, and we've just got tons of them. Uh, it's... Uh, Actually, I think it's an exaggeration. Uh, most wage earners, uh, for most wage earners, the income tax is actually not that complicated. Now, the reason everybody in this room thinks it's so complicated is you earn a lot of money doing a lot of different things, uh, and that's complicated. But uh, no, your general point is right, and if we could simplify uh, and, and standardize the health insurance uh, reimbursement, I mean, I can't figure out what any of the forms I get mean in my own Blue Cross. Well, I think uh, we uh, have a duty now to let Alice have a little bit of rest and relaxation, but I should say that uh, she's a role model for all of us terms of how to keep the integrity of your mental processes while being in the center of the political fray. Uh, I should say that uh, we will welcome you back here in any capacity 
uh, at any time, and we won't make you answer questions about interest rates. <laughs> but uh, we'd love to have you back. You're, uh, you're a bottle for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you.